ok ok so let's go back to our application ok so let's finish the application uh, I mean this optimistic update and let's finish to use it for implementing also the edit operation ok before uh, going to the edit operation and all the rest uh, I just want you to notice one thing that, I mean, a colleague of us, uh, uh, or a colleague of you, uh, mentioned uh, during the break, actually was uh, correct. That means uh, that, uh, you know, uh, with this approach, we run uh, this code, the code in the use effect, twice. When we set uh, the dirty to true, and then we set dirty to false, and the code runs again, okay? It runs twice. It doesn't go into a loop because the second time the value stays the same. So from false, we set it to false again. So there's no risk in you know, having a loop like when you set uh, a state uh, in the form of uh, an, uh, a new reference to an array or an object. Okay? So it g doesn't go in loop but actually it executes twice. And indeed, you can see it in the last example, it didn't close it. So we did the delete, okay? We did the delete, we set uh, dirty to true. So we had the first uh, set of gets, get of the question, you see question, API questions one, and API questions one answers, but then, the dirty went from true to false because we wrote it in the code, right? False. And then the value has changed again for the use effect. Now the use effect doesn't care about the logic of our program, just cares about if something has changed in the list of dependencies. So it changed again from true to false, and so the use effect runs again. Indeed, we have a second get one and second get answers, okay? So, in this case, it's still fine, but I mean, it's not like, it's not a behavior that we really like, okay? Because we are loading things twice, while uh, actually we just wanted to load things once, okay? It doesn't really matter because they are get. And we saw, we, we, we already said, uh, you know, get should be idempotent, so if we run twice, well, doesn't really matter. It, it creates load on the server, but uh, I mean, it's not so important. Uh, but uh, since this is very easy to fix, uh, okay, it's not like, uh, you know, the React uh, um, strict mode and so on, which is another thing, and we, would, we don't want to touch it. Fixing this is uh, easier in the sense that uh, you would like to run things just once, depending on the value of the dirty, right? You can write whatever you want in the code of, an of uh, a callback. If uh, dirty, dirty, okay, you run the code. I mean, there's nothing wrong. Okay, just be careful that in this case, dirty should be true in the beginning, right? Otherwise, the first time, the use effect runs, but the if says no, so it doesn't execute the code because it, it's false, okay? So, I mean, uh, let's try. So we always have the double get in the beginning, that's because of React strict mode, that's fine. Delete, and now you see that you get only once, okay? The question and the answers only once, because the second time the use effect runs the callback, but simply, you know, the first if evaluates as false and nothing is uh, is run in terms of uh, uh, request towards the server. Okay, fine. Okay, this is a very common pattern. That's why we are seeing these things. Okay, I'm not uh, playing just you know, for the sake of playing <laughs> with the code. It's because this is a very common pattern in the way to handle things with the use effect and so on, okay? The second common pattern is uh, 
uh, the fact that we reloaded the question as well, but we actually didn't need to reload the question. Actually, we worked on the answer. Why are we reloading the question? No reason, right? So let's try to only reload the questions. Well, this is more difficult, but uh, uh, it's interesting because it allows us to um, uh, think in, about the use effects, right? So when should we load questions and when should we load answers? Well, in the beginning, that's true. But then the question, I mean, in, in this very simple application, uh, it's enough to load it in the beginning, right? So we don't need to load it again at in many other occasions, okay? Because uh, we are not touching the question. We are touching the answer, so we are deleting, updating, and so on. Answers. And so how can we run the question only once at the load time and then, you know, run this answer by question ID um, every time we need, so we, every time the dirty changes now. Well, actually, we could set a state uh, and add uh, another state to, you know, here. If, uh, do we need to run the question? Yes, okay, and so on. That's not really convenient. I mean, the dirty is actually an application state. So there's something that needs to be checked and synchronized with the server. So I'm much more in favor of having a dirty state, okay, than having a state just, you know, to force things uh, in a NIF, uh, in a use effect, and so on. If you need, you can split the use effect. We have a use effect that just runs once at, the, at loading time, right, when, when the app, when the component mounts just use a different array of dependencies, the empty array. But of course, then we also need the dirty. So we cannot have two different arrays as dependencies. We need to split the use effect. We can use two use effects. So let's try to do this, okay? And again, this is a common pattern. That's why I'm, I'm explaining it and showing it to you live here in the lectures. So use effect. So another use effect. There can be many use effects in your code. Try not to exceed <laughs> a reasonable value, but I mean, just for you, because the more use effect you introduce, the more dependencies there will be in your code, okay? But having a few is still fine if things get simplified. So let's say, um, okay. And of course, don't forget uh, the uh, the dependency array, okay? Fine. And then, well, this could be, this could be enough, right? But no, not, not really, okay? Because we have this question ID, right? So this question ID, question ID is not defined, it is this const. But this const actually, it's just, you know, because I wanted to, to say, you know, I would like to load the question ID 1. But then I put a question with this ID in the state. And here, I could write a question ID, right? So it's a, it's a state. But then another problem comes in. And the problem is, actually, we should load, I mean, should run this uh, get answer by question ID only when the question ID is set. In the beginning, it's the empty object, so this stuff is undefined. Question ID is undefined. So in some ways, we should force the, um, the second use effect to be executed only when the first use effect has executed the call and the, the state has been set. So question is set, okay? How can we do this? Well, we have a list of dependencies. So we could say, well, if question, if a question changes, that's fine, okay? In the, in the beginning, it's the empty 
object and then it, sh it will be another object, another reference to another object. I told you last time in the slides, never use objects and arrays as dependencies. So let's find a, 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 a property of the object that is suitable for our purpose if we have an object. Or with the arrays, let's find something that is suitable for our purpose, like the length, for instance. Typically at load time, the length is fine because you have an empty array and then you have something. So the length for sure changes, okay? So never leave question, so an object here alone, okay? But indeed, you are using question ID. Why don't you depend on question ID? Indeed, that's what it should happen, okay? Fine. And then, and I remember that uh, the use effect called back runs also at load time. So it's true that it runs when this thing changes, but it also runs at uh, load time, okay? And so basically at load time, it will issue a request for question.id, which will be undefined, which we don't like, okay? But we cannot prevent the callback from running. That's the behavior of the use effect. If we don't like to do something, we write code not to do this uh, thing, okay? So like uh, running the API get answer by question ID. And so just add, okay, a, a new condition in the if, if question dot ID, dot ID and, okay? Just not to run the API with undefined. I'm not sure, I didn't check if it crashed or, or not, okay? If it crashes, it's a problem because it stops executing your JavaScript. And if it doesn't crash, in any case, it will not send something meaningful to the server. So the server will reply with some errors and we just waste the bandwidth and, mm, I mean, there's no reason why sending this uh, request towards the server, okay? So, in short here, we split what was contained in use effect called back in two parts. One use effect that only runs at mount time and the second use effect that only runs, uh, well, runs at mount time, but it does nothing because the if says uh, do nothing, okay? It's false. And then it will run when question ID has changed and it's also in the dependency list and dirty has changed. And dirty only if it's true. So we do, don't, don't run a second time when the dirty passes changes from uh, uh, true to false, okay? Because the callback will be called by a React, but we will not run any code, okay? Except for the if. Okay, fine, let's see if it works. Let's reload again. Okay, now you see, there are two, quest two, two requests with questions one. Those are the ones here, okay? Use effect with the empty array. And there is just one request for answers. Why? It's not that uh, the second use effect has not been run, okay? It was run at the mount time twice, but in these two times, basically they've said, well, it's false. And just that's all, okay? And then it was run a third time when the question ID changed. So uh, the state for question, yeah, que set question was set. The ID changed the value from undefined to one. And then the use effect was run. Question ID was true, uh, no, was one. So it was not undefined. So actually it evaluated as true for, for the Boolean condition. And dirty was true because we set as true in the beginning and not, nobody has touched it yet. Okay? And then that's all. Get answer by question ID. Okay. Uh, well, initial loading. Okay, fine. Uh, set dirty false. Okay. So the dirty false change uh, is something that has changed. So the use effect callback is run a fourth time, okay? The fourth time, again, question ID evaluates true, but dirty evaluates false, and the end is false. And so the callback is run, but no code is executed. No API get, answer, get answers by question ID, okay? Yeah, that's the question. Is 
No, I uh, here. I, I need to set the dirt in any case to false because I need to notify React uh, the fact that he needs to change the state. Yeah? If it's not false, okay. Yeah, I mean, we can we can put the condition here, I mean, to, to avoid running a second time the use of, yeah, yeah, that's possible, yeah, I think so, I mean, uh, but I mean, we don't really care too much about the implementation, okay, so it's fine that you can avoid uh, this uh, second uh, call, okay, but uh, since the second call is not heavy in the sense that it just uh, runs an if, it bubble it to false and that's all, we don't really need to care too much, okay? Uh, okay, so thank you for the uh, remark. Uh, so let's finish uh, work, okay? So uh, we still are we're still missing the edit, which is actually the save existing answer. We could have called the uh, you know edit answer, but uh, yeah. And again. Uh, same logic. Well, this this is really old stuff, right? So let's delete it. Uh, same logic. That means uh, uh, let's create the uh, a new object answer. We cannot just simply take the uh, you know the answer as it is. That is uh, the result of the edit operations. Rem uh, recall that. And let's do another way. Okay. Let's spread the object. So make a copy of the object, and then we add status uh, updated. Updated. Okay. That's because uh, we would like to have this, uh, you know, mm, colored the bar in the application for the edit answer. Okay, edited answer. And then again, uh, API uh, update answer. Answers, answer, yes, dot then. Uh, again, uh, is there any value we should check? I mean, mm, things will be reloaded uh, again, okay? Because we use the, this approach with the set dirty, okay? So, it's true, it, it might return the, the new answer that has been inserted in the database with the new, no, there's no new ID, the ID is old. Uh, I mean, we don't really care because we are going to reload everything from the database in any case, okay? Otherwise, if you're not going to reload stuff, of course, you should take the value here, okay? So, provided that when you say a, a, a response a, instead of reject, you provide a value, but that's normal case, uh, and, and you use it, okay? And you do set, answer, whatever, okay? But we are trying to use a different approach. Catch, uh, uh, R, uh, at the moment, let's just console log, okay? And then we will come back to this point, okay? And you see, if you have organized things uh, well, it should work without any any more additions, okay? So let's try. Let's edit something, this stuff which is really ugly, ugly answer, okay? Save. So you have seen the, the yellow bar that then disappeared, and let's always check what's happening. Put the pre-flight request, we don't care. Put, that's the update with the request. You see ugly answer. And the response was, okay, just one. Uh, rows, number of rows that have changed, one. But I don't really care because then I do get answers with the same logic as before. And I get the new answers, okay? So if you organize things well, uh, the application should work 
more or less easily, okay? Uh, I mean, we, we are already have a quite complex application, if you think. There's an application that shows you data wh when it loads and goes to the server and asks for data, and then you have these three fundamental operations implemented in, in a very well manner. It means that uh, the user gets notified and then uh, uh, the actual value from the server are loaded, okay? And we didn't do that many modifications. Okay, oops. Was, yeah. uh, the only thing we need to finish here is, you know, this console log error, which I don't really like that much, okay? Well, handling errors is always a problem in application. I'm, it's always uh, a problem in general in programming, okay? That's why you, you saw the try-catch approach of Java and so on. Because, uh, you know, programmers are lazy by nature, I would say, and never want to handle errors. But, I mean, it, it's up to you. Let's say, let's try to, um, you know, create at least a sketch of the application, so a draft of the application before you try to handle errors and so on, okay? And then once you have a, a reasonably well-working application, you can focus on handling errors, okay? And I just want to, to give you a hint on how you could best handle errors in an application like this. Well, there are many cases where errors can happen. Like typically when you speak uh, with the server, so you send a request to the server, there can be a reply with an error and so on, okay? So just create a function. As you create, uh, you know, the vote, uh, the delete and so on, let's create a handle error function. Uh, where did I put it before or afterwards? Before. Let's create it here. Function handle error. Error, okay. Console log error, okay. Very simple one, but instead of having the console log spread around in your application, every time you have a problem, let's uh, try to focus on, you know, handle error, error, okay. Uh, this sketch. Catch the uh, here I didn't do okay. Catch uh, error and error okay. Uh, again here as well and error. Okay, now it's no different from before. It's just a function okay. But the point is that I centralize the place where I handle the error. And then I can do something more interesting here in the handle error, okay? Instead of the console log, once everything is working, okay? Because you don't get points because you handle error, but the application is not working at the exam, okay? First, the application must work. And then we will focus on, you know, all the, these uh, small things, uh, which will help you to get, you know, the, the highest mark. But first, you know, of course, things uh, should work and should be implemented correctly, especially from the point of view of security for this course. Okay, so how do we show errors to the user? The user doesn't read the console, it's not a developer like you that hopefully you, you work always with the console open, okay, in the browser. So the user only see the interface, so you need to find a place to show errors in your application. And the place could be uh, put somewhere in the, in the main layout, I think I put it there, right? Uh, yeah, error message. And of course, I need the, a, a state to uh, uh, to keep the information about which error has happened, as I did in the form. You remember the form? Uh, you see this error message, okay? This error message was uh, to be shown here with an alert, okay? Nothing really special, it's just a, 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 rectang a rectangle where you put some text, uh, typically uh, it's a red uh, background, just to keep the attention of the, the user, okay? So this is a, a local state of the form, so it's, prob it's a problem of the form in terms of, uh, you know, there's something that doesn't validate it well. I expect a field to be filled in, uh, so like uh, the text uh, of the, uh, answer cannot be empty, I tell the user, okay? Uh, this is just an example. 
Uh, so let's create something like this in the application. And then we will give it for granted for next time. So we will not focus on that one that much. Const, uh, uh, what's the error message? Set error message. Nothing really special. Uh, uh, an empty string, if there's a string, there's something to show, otherwise it doesn't matter, okay? And so in short, let's say, uh, well, let me copy this function because it's a bit uh, complex. Um, the handle error. Of course, I will provide you this uh, this uh, function as well at the end of the lecture. Okay. Why well, it's so complex? Because uh, I mean, I I I messed uh, a little bit in the code. I would say I need to check. Uh, I mean, if if they are my APIs return a value with a rejected promise, it's an object, it has a field, it's called uh, error, but there can be also a JSON object coming from the server that has a field uh, uh, error, but actually the errors coming from the server, errors are an array, okay? So I'm just showing the first one. Okay, just, uh, you know, make sure that you don't use undefined values. That's uh, the only purpose of this code, okay? And then, of course, you could have a, a nicer stuff where you have a list of all the errors and so on, but, I mean, try not to spend too much things on these uh, uh, um, conditions, okay? You handle, you know, something, uh, the errors in a reasonable way, so you handle reasonable errors and that's all. Okay, also for the exam. So, uh, set error message. Uh, no, why it's error message? I didn't test it enough. No, error message, that's a variable. Set error message, that's a state. Okay, fine. And then you, we need to show the error message, right? We need to uh, a place. The place could be, well, you could do it in the layout, but then, uh, I mean, in the layout for this application, I don't really like it that much because, uh, um, yeah, I, I, it's reasonable, I mean, but uh, since uh, when you edit something, there's uh, the local error from the form, and then when you finish editing, you go back to the answer table, so the slash route, right? So the route index. Also with the add, the same. If something is wrong from the server, uh, or something happens uh, when you talk with the server, again, you are on the slash route. So maybe it's better to put this uh, information in the slash route, so in the table, on the top of, before the table, okay? But it's just my personal choice. I mean, it could also be something that you put in the layout, okay? Mm, depends on, you know, on the place where you want to show things. Uh, let's try to stick with this example so I don't lose too much time, okay? Uh, so error message, uh, of course, I need to pass it. Okay, either it's a global context, that's another possibility. You create a context uh, and you put uh, there the errors and you use it wherever you, wherever you need uh, them uh, into, the, into your components, okay? That's another possibility. We are not exploring that because, uh, you know, uh, I, I try to keep the, the code as simple as possible uh, for what is possible in a complex application like this, okay? And then I also post the set error message because when you click on the button, you need to reset the status. Otherwise, the the the, um, the string with the error will stay will stay there, will stay in your status of your application. Set error message, okay? And so, uh, in the answer route, so I'll go to the definition. We uh, uh, we add this. Uh, alert okay uh, so let's put it here okay so alert 
Uh, alert. Okay. Uh, well, I should have a row call and so on. Okay. So let me copy it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's two lines. I hope it's not too frustrating, but I mean, no. What's the component? That's the component. That's the answer run. No, that should be enough. Up. up. Oh, maybe it was before. Answer uh, route. Okay. So it's nothing really special. If it's set, I show something. If it's not set, I show nothing. Okay? So props error message, yes, alert. Variant danger, so it's red, dismissible, that's a property that says it, that it makes a, an X appear on the, on the top right. On close, that's an event uh, created by the alert component uh, and provided by Bootstrap React. Props set error message, empty string. Okay, so I read the message, and that's all. Otherwise, null, so nothing to show, okay? Let's see if I define the alert. Yes, it was there. Let's try. I mean, now that there's, you, you should create an error, right? <laughs> to test it, because luckily everything was working. So let's go and create an error. Uh, let's go to the API, and... Uh, um, yeah, let's uh, take uh, something like, uh, yeah, this one oh, was, was already there, okay? A post with the body, okay? It's difficult to create an error in the, in the delete, okay? <laughs> because there's no body and so on, okay? You can, we also say that if the ID don't, doesn't exist, we don't care. We return true, okay? We return success, okay? So you need to find a place where you can insert an error. Okay. Oh no, this one, Ah, this one was not implemented yet. Uh, I don't have time to, to do all today. Uh, get answered by question ID. So let's do in the add, okay? So, body, let's say body empty, whatever. Let's put an empty string, okay? Okay, so let's try to add something. I don't care what, what's added here. Okay, you see what happened? You're not sure, right? So let's check network tab, option, let's say preflight, post. Post was sent uh, as a, a request with no payload. Okay, I set the empty string as payload. And the response from the server was, I'm very angry. There's a lot of errors, okay? Because on the server, there's some validation. There should be some field set and so on, okay? And so, so the path that has been followed, you need to check here. I mean, uh, we are in the, it was not response okay, so it was the else, response JSON. Why response JSON here? Because the server answered with the JSON. It's my choice. That's the best way to communicate the errors in the body, okay? We have JSON, we use JSON. So, uh, then message, uh, reject message, okay? So, that's uh, uh, the JSON value that has been converted into a JavaScript object that has been returned to the caller uh, as a, a value of the rejected promise, okay? The other case is basically, um, it's difficult to, I mean, it's not JSON. It cannot parse the JSON, but I mean, you really need to work a lot on the server to return something which is not the JSON, okay? So you should not use dot JSON, but send whatever string you like, okay? But this is not typically the case. So let's go back to the application. And the application has this handle error, okay? So it checks what's, uh, what's inside the, the object and so on, and in the end, it, it extracts the first error message and it shows it to you, okay? But also note what's happening here. I mean, the green stuff uh, didn't get, didn't go away. Why? Because we didn't say to do anything else. We just uh, add a catch, handle error, and that's all. In the handle error, at a certain point, we should say, well, 
I have enough, okay? Uh, let's reload what's available from the server. There's been an error, okay, fine. I mean, either you leave the, the, uh, the status of the application like this, you could connect the reload with the, clo uh, with the, when, uh, when the user clicks on the close, that's fine, that's an option. Or you simply, after a while, you, at the end of the handle error, Okay, after a while being set them out, we reload stuff, and we have the dirty, right? Set dirty, false, ah, true, sorry, true. Okay, uh, and there's a callback, I don't know, two seconds, whatever, okay. Something reasonable for the exam as well, and, uh, okay. I mean, don't put 10 seconds because at the exam we, <laughs> we, we are quick <laughs> in testing things, but also not uh, two milliseconds, okay? I mean, something reasonable, one, two seconds, okay? In an actual application, you want, mm, might want to put a, a higher value, but I mean, I mean, something which is reasonable, okay? So let's add something, so let's uh, create the error. You see? Now it disappears, okay? That was the optimistic update. The optimistic update has failed, so the answer was uh, added, but the, for some reason the, uh, the server came back with an error, okay? And now it disappears because you reload the list of answers from the server. And then, and then it's up to the user to close this stuff, right? Because uh, the user have time to, need to have time to read the, the error message, right? Okay? And that's all. Let's uh, just, uh, you know, finish this uh, discussion, fixing the error, because I don't like to commit code with the error, okay? Uh, yeah, fine. Okay. Uh, uh, now it should work, right? So, mm, I mean, it's not really fundamental to test for all the errors uh, in this sense. I mean, communication errors and so on, but, uh, I mean, application errors for sure. I mean, uh, if the application requires that you set something in the form and so on, that's a requirement written in the text of the application, and that should be implemented and work well for the exam. The rest is, uh, let's say, an addition that helps you to get a better mark, okay? But we will come back uh, and discuss about the exam uh, again, okay, next lecture when we are closer to the exam. Okay, so more or less that's finished. Okay, I, I still need uh, the, in the implementation of the upvote, downvote, but it's exactly the same, okay? Um, you need to decide, you know, a, a color uh, to show that it's been, it's been uh, uh, updating on the server and depending on the answer, uh, you, you decide what to do and basically you set the dirty again to, to, fo to true and, and it reloads from the server. Okay, so let's commit this stuff. Uh, um, I don't commit a database so you don't have the, uh, the wrong stuff. Okay, so last question from lecture. Okay, and so we can move on. So, basically we finished the discussion here. I hope everything is clear, you have two labs to experiment with this stuff. So tomorrow, there will be my colleague, and next week, uh, there will, uh, it's probably me that will come to the lab, okay? But next week, not this week, okay? Um, <coughs> uh, so, I recommend you to, you know, to understand these things very well, because uh, you will for sure use, use effect in your final application for the exam as well. Okay, but also it's needed because uh, when you need to interact with the server at a certain point, at least at the beginning, you need to load something. And then the rest can happen whenever it's needed, like here. Basically things uh, happen in the event handler, right? So, like in the delete answer, delete answer is an event handler, okay? And then it also sets, uh, just for our convenience, uh, a state because it, it, it says to use the fact to reload stuff and so on. But with copy and pasting, 
okay? Or defining another function, you could, we could have uh, done without the dirty state, okay? But since dirty state, it's an application state. I mean, the application has something which is not in sync, it's not synchronized with the server, I like to keep this state as an application state, okay? For more, uh, for different cases, probably you might want to, you know, not to keep it as a, a, a state in the application. Uh, but th that's up to you. That's the difference between one submission and the other submission when, when you uh, s send the exam for, for, when you send the code for the exam, okay? So this is uh, all for the life cycle. I know it was long, but it's also the most, one of the most important uh, um, topics, okay, for the application. For, for, the, for the React applications. Okay, so I would say that now we can move on uh, and start discussing about authentication, which will take uh, quite a lot of time as well, but uh, that's uh, basically the last topic of this course. And maybe it's also the more interesting ones for you, okay? You are in the cybersecurity course of study, and of, of course, authentication is a place where security plays a major role. Okay, so we will not finish things today, but uh, we will uh, discuss these things in the lecture in next week, uh, Monday and th uh, Thursday, okay? But let's start, uh, you know, understand something about authentication. Because uh, it's a long topic and uh, um, uh, we need to uh, understand how, implement, how to implement this in, in the application. First of all, especially here where the course is uh, focused on cybersecurity, we need to distinguish two things uh, very well. One thing is authentication and one thing is authorization, okay? Authentication means verify uh, you are who you say you are. So your identity, the identity of the user, I'm connecting as Enrico, he's connecting as uh, whatever name he has and so on, okay? But the, his identity, okay? Authorization is what am I authorized to do, what I can do with the application, okay? So it's about permission, it's not about identity, okay? So it's like uh, I, uh, I am Enrico, and since I am the teacher, I can update uh, the material on the GitHub, okay? Because as a user, I also get a set of permissions, okay? You are the student, and you can take the stuff, but you cannot update it, okay? So this is the authorization, what you are authorized to do. I've read a, a post on the internet that explained this thing in a very nice example, like, you go to the airport, okay? At a certain point, they ask you for your ID, okay? That's the authentication check. And then you have a boarding pass to enter the airplane, okay? And this boarding pass is your authorization to enter at an, in a certain airplane. You cannot just board whatever airplane you like, okay? You need to have authorization to enter an airplane, okay? The two things uh, goes together because the authorization is linked uh, to who you are, okay? But it's uh, like a token. Actually, we will talk about token later. Uh, it's the boarding pass, it's the authorization. Uh, in that case, it's printed. In, in our case, it will be a set of bits uh, done in a certain way that basically gives you permission to do something, okay? So one thing is who you are, and then one thing is what you can do. Uh, typically, what you can do depends on who you are, okay? Um, okay, so now in this set of slides, uh, we will first focus on authentication, okay? So first we will discuss what you can do once you authenticate, so once you say who you are, typically with something like username and password. Okay, username is who you are, and the password is something that can prove that you are who you are saying that you are. Okay, of course this stuff is complex, but you choose uh, the cybersecurity course of study because you want to learn these things, okay? But my advice is, uh, I mean the advice in general and for these topics is 
try to rely, rely only upon best practice and standardized process. Try not to invent anything, at least until you, are, you got a degree and you're very uh, confident in what you do and you became a cybersecurity expert and you have experience and so on and so maybe in collaboration with others you can try to develop something, okay? Otherwise, try just to learn things and not to make uh, errors, okay? That's already a good result. Okay? Or at least uh, spot errors uh, in others' implementations and so on. Okay? So uh, this is uh, difficult in general. I it's time consuming. You will see we will have to add a lot of code because you need to handle sessions, uh, you need to handle uh, additional state information on the server side, communicate with the client. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Of course, I will provide you with this code, and maybe this code is uh, the easiest for you in the sense that uh, it will be probably more or less enough to take it as it is and just adapt it a little bit uh, to your case, okay? You don't have to reinvent, uh, you know, the whole authentication process for the exam. If there's a page with username and password, that's nothing to invent. I mean, it's just a normal page, use a password, okay? Uh, but sometimes, uh, you know, authentication can become complex. We will not see this example, but you know that when you go in, on, in a website and they say, well, do you want to register? Do you have a Google account? Do you have a Facebook account? Do you have a Meta, whatever its name, a GitHub account and so on? You can authenticate with this service, but you cannot share and you don't want to share your Google password, which is also your email password and so on, with these services. So there's a lot of things that needs to happen to authenticate you, okay? We will not cover cases as complex as, like, as this, okay? But at least a basic case like username and password that is important for us because it also allows us to understand all the issues uh, that are involved in uh, having an authenticated issue, a, an authenticated user, sorry. Uh, in particular, having a session and where to store session information, okay? Uh, this slide is quite complex. Uh, maybe you can have a look uh, with, um, I mean, uh, at home. <laughs> when, uh, maybe we can back when we finish discussing all these things, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of places where you can do many things uh, and how you do things and when you do things, okay? Uh, of course, uh, I mean, the user needs to log in, log out, and navigate in the application, but then in the React application, you need to keep track of these things. The browser needs to do things, sometimes automatically, sometimes we need to do it uh, manually by programming the application. The server needs to remember stuff, and the routes, uh, that means the APIs on the server, they need to do checks and so on. So there are a lot of things to do, okay? Uh, we will see all things uh, while we proceed in the discussion. So uh, this is just a summary and, you know, as a reference, we cannot, I mean, discussing this slide would take uh, half an hour and we'll, we'll talk uh, of too many abstract concepts. Uh, so it's better if we see them as we proceed, okay? So first of all, that's the HTTP protocol. You already know P HTTP. You uh, learned it in the net network um, course where you discussed about networks. It's a, an application layer protocol, but the point from, from uh, the point of view of our application now is that HTTP is stateless. So it, it doesn't have a state on the server, okay? A, as we saw it, uh, until now, everything is contained in the request that we send as we did before. I mean, we want a list of the answers uh, that correspond to question ID one, and this one is sent by the client. We would like to add a, a question with these fields and so on. Okay, this has been done. And, and this, this is all. I mean, it's not related with the next HTTP request that you will do uh, to the server, okay? So each request is independent and must be self-contained. So. In the request, you need to send all the information that you need to process uh, on the server, okay? But, of course, you know that uh, in real applications, uh, you might need to keep information between different interactions from the client to the server. 
And this is exactly the case when you are authenticated. Right? So first page, you put username and password, and then you interact with the application, and you have access to your private data. So somebody has to remember the fact that you authenticated, OK? It's not like a form that appears in, you know, in, no, but it's not about the forms. It's about the interaction of client and server. So it's not like uh, you leave the page where you did the authentication. It's the fact that every time you request something new to the server, the HTTP request is, uh, uh, should be self-contained. There should be some way of saying that you, this is a request that has been, that comes from an authenticated user, okay? And you, you use it every day. I mean, you don't even know me sometimes. You are, you, have a, uh, you are in an online shop, and you put things in a shopping cart. So this shopping cart is remembered between the pages of the application, right? Um, or you log in to the uh, student page on the, the Polito web portal, and uh, you see all the information about you and so on. And you do an operation, and then, and then the website remembers the operation you did. You added a, a course, you removed the course, and so on, okay? Uh, so uh, we use it every day. Uh, how can this work? So first of all, let's understand how this works, and then we will try to implement all this stuff in our single page application programming model, okay? So first of all, a session, what's a session? A session is a temporary and interactive data exchange between two or more parties. Uh, devices, uh, here it means a client and the server, the browser actually, and the server, okay? Uh, it involves uh, one or more messages. Uh, often, one of the parties keeps the state of the application, and in our case, the server will keep state of the the state of the application, but not the use state. Okay, the use state doesn't matter here. It's just the state in the sense uh, that we were saying before. There's a book in the cart. Okay, you have been logged in as Enrico on the web portal, and so on. Okay. So this information, this, the thing that needs to be remembered by the server is the state information of the session, okay? That is the information that will be needed by the server to make the application work, in short, okay? It is established, uh, the session, it is established at a certain point in time, it ended at some point later. Typically, you log in and you start the session. You log out and the session finishes, so it's not valid anymore, okay? Typically, that's what happens, okay? And to maintain a session, we rely on a session ID, okay? An ID, that means a string uh, that we receive after we do the authentication, and we should keep it in the client. So it means in the browser, in some places. We are not saying where we keep it yet, okay? Uh, the browser will keep it in JavaScript, in the cookies, in the session store, whatever, okay? And we will discuss the advantages of a, you know, all of these solutions, advantages and disadvantages. But the browser will keep this information, this ID, so this string, and it will send at every request that need to understand that we have a session active, okay? Because otherwise, there's no way to link different HTTP requests from the server side, as seen from the server side. The server receives a request, and it's always a standalone request. But if it can see a session ID that, it, uh, that the server knows, the session ID will be used by the server to remember the fact that uh, it has a state associated with this session, and what is, uh, I mean, the, the client requesting this operation can do or, can, or is allowed to do, um, you know, the operation that is uh, requesting to do, okay? So this uh, session ID must be stored on the client side, must be sent by the client at every request which is part of the session, because otherwise you have no way on the server to recognize this request belongs to a session. Must not contain sensitive data. This is readable by the client. Okay, I'm not sure if we have uh, 
cookies uh, yeah somewhere storage yeah you see how many stuff there Th this is these are cookies that's the way in which we will start the sessions okay you see that I can read every every cookie it's in the browser okay so if I have a session ID okay you see you blah blah blah, blah. I, do, I, I should not be able to extract information easily, okay? I don't want to see a password here, okay? A very simple way, you know, to, to create a session ID could be to put the username and the password in the session ID, okay? That's really a stupid approach, right? Because uh, anybody who is opening the, the inspector here, we will see the username and password in clear text here, okay? So, the session ID must be generated in a different way, must be, you know, uh, must not contain sensitive data. And also it must be protected from eavesdropping during communications. So this ID, as all the other data, is traveling from the client to the server and vice versa, okay? So while in transit in the network, it should be protected. It means encrypted. It cannot be read by anybody. You are talking with your bank, and the bank is not, uh, you know, uh, close to you, uh, next next uh, desk. Okay, it, it's uh, somewhere in the cloud. We don't really know even exactly where, but uh, there's a lot of uh, communication. So there's a, there's a long path the information travels to go from the client to the server, and if somebody looks at the bits in transit in the network, you shouldn't be able to read the, this section ID. Okay, because this session ID is what, uh, is what the server uses to recognize you as an authenticated user. If you have this session ID, you can impersonate a request coming from uh, an authenticated client, okay? And typically, and that's the way in which we will do, we typically, we store it, uh, in, uh, the session ID, and we will send it as a cookie, okay? The cookie, very specific te technical term, you should already know, more or less, but in, an, in any case, we have a slide about this. Uh, it's a feature of HTTP, so it's a, a special header of uh, uh, HTTP that allows you to exchange this uh, session ID information between the client and the server, okay? So it's true that basic HTTP has no uh, it's stateless, so uh, does not make a session ID travel from uh, client to server and vice versa. But if we add an additional header with this information, we can make this additional information travel from the client to the server and vice versa. Okay? Uh, and the best way to make this information travel from client and server and vice versa is using a cookie. Because it's a standardized method, it's handled by the browser in a simple way. So what is handled by the browser for us is always uh, nice, okay? Because we don't have to implement. And also, uh, it's been implemented and tested because the browser is used by many uh, users, okay? So the more people use uh, an application, the better it is because if there are bugs, uh, typically, the the bugs are being, uh, are being fixed, okay? Uh, your code is your responsibility, okay? If you have a bug in your code, you are the one that should fix it. Uh, if uh, there's a bug in a bigger project, in a browser and so on, there's a, maybe many, many persons, many, many developers that look at the bug and try to find a, a, a good solution for, for the bug, for fixing the bug, okay? And the cookie is just a small portion of information inserted in HTTP headers. If you are curious, it's also standardized, okay? So very well standardized, which is never uh, bad. It's automatically handled by the browser. It's automatically stored by the browser in the browser cookie storage. Again, there's uh, another place, another tab in the browser. You'll discover a lot of tabs in this course, okay? I think that's the last one, yeah. Uh, the storage, and there are cookies, okay? There are other stuff, but uh, we will see them only if we need them. This is the cookie storage for this website, okay? Actually, localhost. 
Actually, I have other stuff running on localhost. <laughs> That's why you see many, many cookies. And actually, there's no cookie actually for our application at the moment. So they are all from another other applications. Um, and it's automatically sent by the browser to servers when performing a request to the same domain and path that originally sent the cookie. Okay? So the cookie does not exist in the beginning. It's something that the server sends to the client because it's created by the server. It's a session ID, and the sessions are created by the server. Okay? When, typically, when you authenticate, so you say, I'm Enrico with this password, and the server will create a session ID just for me that needs to be kept a secret. So when it travels on the network, it, it, must, it must be kept secret, so encrypted, so that somebody looking at the bits cannot see it. And I need to send it to the server every time I need to show I'm the one who authenticated before, okay? And note that this is uh, 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 something which is linked to the domain and the path, but not the port, okay? So you remember the same origin policy. This is something a bit different, okay? So the port is not included, and that's why I would say, unfortunately, probably, because that, unfortunately. You can see all the cookies for local host, which is the host, okay? And then there's the path. Everybody likes to set the path as slash, so the root. And so basically all applications running on local host can have access to these cookies, okay? which is not a really nice choice, but that's the choice uh, that we, you know, the developers of browsers uh, and uh, actually of cookies did uh, when they developed it, okay? And again, that's, you know, for historical reasons, uh, maybe today one would add the port as well, but that's not the way cookies work today, okay? So we need to know, and that's all. So just be careful, okay? Um, these cookies uh, can be uh, sent automatically by the browser on the same domain and path. So it means if I have a cookie that has been set by a request to slash answers, this will be only set when you request uh, the same uh, domain and slash answers something. Okay, even empty, but slash answers. If it's slash, it means any place in the in the in the server APIs uh, for, for our case. There are options, basically via JavaScript, via JavaScript uh, to send them in other cases, okay? But we will see them when it's needed. Never store sensitive information in a cookie, okay? So password, secrets, and so on, okay? The cookie should be an uh, identifier, so a string, as the one we saw before, okay? That means nothing, okay? I mean, session cookie, of course, there can be other, you know, service cookies to do other stuff that, you know, have a different meaning. But session IDs, session cookies, should mean nothing. Basically, they should be a, a random set of characters that are unique for the authenticated user. That's all. Okay? Never put anything yourself into a cookie. Okay? Uh, yeah, let's have a look at this slide. And um, yeah, three slides, and then that's all. And so you think about cookies and you rearse cookies for next time in case you need. Okay? Some relevant cookie attributes set by the server. Well, of course, you need to, to have a name and a value. Without that, we, we, I mean, the cookie is useless because uh, we cannot retrieve the cookie. We use the name of the cookie to retrieve the value of the cookie, okay? And, and the browser as well. It uses the name and the, and the value to send it to the uh, server. And then there are options like secure, IHTTP only, and expiration date. They are optional. Secure is set. The cookie will be sent to, to the server only using HTTPS, okay? You know that... Uh, 
that's a version of the HTTP protocol that goes over a secure encrypted connection that is HTTPS, okay? Uh, actually, let's say the, the protocol version HTTP is the same, it goes over an encrypted channel, okay? Uh, and for, in, for convenience, we call it HTTPS, where S means secure. HTTP only, if set, the cookie will be inaccessible to JavaScript code running in the browser. That's uh, quite peculiar, but we will use it. Because one of the main risks of having this uh, cookie ID available for your application is that uh, somebody injects uh, some JavaScript code that you don't want in your application, and this uh, JavaScript code steals uh, the session ID. And once it has a session ID for a valid session, it can use it. You are logged in in your bank account, and they can use it and see what you see in your bank account and do operations if they allow you to do. And there is also an expiration date, okay? That could be optional in the case we saw before. Actually, yeah, that's the expiration date, okay? Uh, to to uh, 2100, okay? So in you know, we were all dead, maybe, uh, by that time. But I mean, it can be shorter, of course, and can be also only, this, only the current uh, session, so when you close the browser, it disappears, okay? So no actual expiration, just it's in the memory of the browser. And when you close the program, the memory is deleted, okay? But we will come back on this when it's needed. And so the interaction basically is like this. We will come back to this point. At a certain time, you log in, you get the cookie, and the browser stores this cookie. And when it needs uh, to uh, get information which is protected, so it means uh, it's protected by authentication, it needs to send the cookie. And so the server will check the cookie and will give back the information only if the cookie is valid and the user is authorized uh, to do the operations to get the information, okay? But we will come back to this uh, next lecture. Let me finish with this. Yes. Uh, I mean, this would be the advice. Always use HTTPS and the secure option in cookies. Nowadays, there's no reason not to use it, okay? Also, always use the HTTP only option in cookies. And b the best frameworks uh, uh, for authentication and so on, typically already do that because it's a good security practice. And the second point is up to you in case you need to decide the session ID. Never, never store sensitive information in cookies. Good frameworks never do that, okay? Or if they do that, for some reason, they do it in a secure way, okay? So you cannot read the information on the client, okay? But you also see this uh, box, only for this course, only for configuration simplicity, will not be using HTTPS. I know it might sound strange, but uh, I mean, using HTTPS, it's uh, kind of uh, heavy, and in our case, it doesn't really add anything to uh, you know, the way in which we are developing the application. It's just setting a few bits, but it creates a lot of problems for our case, just for our case, because we are running everything on localhost. We are running everything locally. We don't uh, want to pay to have a certificate that is needed to run HTTPS and, and all this stuff, okay? So, only for this course, only for the purpose of this course, we will not set HTTPS, okay? Uh, because it, it's, uh, I mean, a lot of configuration issues, which are more about, uh, you know, uh, uh, system level. Uh, they are at the system level. You need to store the certificate. You need to store the private key of the certificate. When you, uh, when you start the server, somebody has to decrypt this private key and start uh, the server and so on. So a lot of issues, uh, and from the point of view of how the application works, it doesn't really matter for us, okay? 
So I know we are in the cybersecurity course, but I hope you forget us if we are not using the HTTPS. But if we are able to deploy the application in some actual places, we'll try to show you, you know, how to use HTTPS. But typically, in these places, it's just a click, so that's fine. But uh, it makes us very inconvenient to test, uh, you know, the project for the exam and so on. That's why we are forgetting about HTTPS. But in, a, in an actual application, you will always use HTTPS. Today, encryption and decryption are quite lightweight operation for modern hardware. So there's no reason why you shouldn't use it, okay? So, mm, and you see uh, all the websites, all the reputable websites basically today are served over HTTPS, okay? Okay, so think a little bit about this. If you don't uh, remember about uh, HTTP and the cookie, try to rehearse a little bit for next time, that is next Monday with me. Tomorrow there will be lab, room uh, uh, 10i, right? And uh, uh, there will be my colleague Antonio, and you will uh, try to develop the server client, client server communication, okay? And next lab, uh, next week, uh, you finish that part, and we will go on with the authentication, okay? And in the meanwhile, I'll try to, uh, you know, publish a draft plan of the course uh, schedule until the end, okay? Okay. So I see no questions, so thank you for your attention. See you uh, next Monday, actually. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>